Okay, so you're going to have way too much of me starting now. Um, and you can have even more of me, if that's not enough, on this website, speech.zone. That's the domain name. And on there, you'll find a variety of things. And if you like, if you like to have a copy of slides in front of you while I'm speaking, you'll actually find them already on here um, in this special course at the top of the courses section. And later, when we do the hands-on, we'll use this website to, uh, for the instructions for that. Okay, so if you want to follow along, there's a PDF of slides there. And we'll look at this site um, later on a little bit as well. Right. So we've got two hours to talk about text processing. And, you know, there's a lot to say, and, and, and yet there isn't so much to say. Because I think it's pretty fair to say that there have not been major advances in text processing. There have been very incremental, grindingly slow advances in text processing in the last 10 years. And a lot of people are very lazy about their text processing in their, in their speech synthesis system. Certainly we are. Um, so people for English will typically use Festival, which is our system, as their standard front end. We haven't touched the text processing of Festival for a decade, and, and more than a decade, really. We built it. It was very good at its time, and it hasn't got any better. In industry, of course, things are very different. Um, but the techniques haven't really advanced a whole lot. They were just kind of fixing the exceptions and writing ever larger dictionaries and rule sets and catching the edge cases, which is fine and it works, but it doesn't scale. So, before we talk about all of this, um, let's talk about other places you can get information from. Um, I would recommend uh, two places. One, if you're not at all familiar with any sort of natural language processing at all, um, is just to start with this book here. And this is the excellent Jurafsky and Martin. It's a thousand pages of, of excellent stuff. And it, for what it is, it's a, a very good value book, a big, thick book. An equally thick book, but a bit more expensive because it's a more specialized book. It, but even better is Paul Taylor's book with the excellent title Text-to-Speech Synthesis. And it does what it says on the cover. It does everything in Text-to-Speech Synthesis, including uh, Paul's attempt at signal processing as well, which is pretty good. And so these are the sources I would always refer my students to, to find out more about this. So what we're going to look at in the next couple of hours, and we'll take a break halfway. Um, what is this thing called a front end? And we're going to start a little bit philosophically by thinking, how does this problem of going to, from text to speech break itself down naturally into stages, if it does? And, and it may be useful eventually to think that it doesn't really break itself into discrete stages. But for the purpose of explanation, and certainly the summer school, we're going to pretend that it breaks itself into these various discrete stages. Um, and one of the stages, the first one, is to deal with this messy input text and get it into good shape in a way that we might then have some chance of knowing how to say it. So it's getting from how it's written to how it's said in, in the most general sense. And I think... I'd like you to view text-to-speech throughout this and throughout all of the rest of the other presentations as this straightforward regression problem. A hard regression problem, but we can define it very straightforwardly as input text and output waveform. And how we get from one to the other is entirely up to us. We could imagine some incredibly sophisticated, powerful regression model that gets us all the way there in one giant step. And given enough data, we make it imagine that we might be able to do that and learn that, that relationship from arbitrary, raw text, unnormalized punctuation and abbreviations and everything else that's going on all the way to the waveform. Nobody can do that. That's just too hard. There's too many different things going on there to be able to pile all that into a model, into one model. And it's also very hard to get enough data to, to do that. So it does get broken down into stages. And those stages are decided you know, by experts where to draw the line along this long journey from text to speech. And just to be clear, what we mean when we say a regression problem, regression is the prediction of a continuously valued quantity, in this case, the waveform. If we're predicting a discrete value quantity, we call it classification. And later on, we're going to see in this front end, we're doing both classification and sometimes also regression. So. Let's just get a quick overview of, of what we need to do in this whole front end, get a, a, a complete idea of what happens in this pipeline. So we've got some input text, and we'd like to start discovering more about the text, things that are useful to know how to say the text. 
And some of them will be directly um, useful to say it, and some will just be needed by another stage further down the pipeline. So one thing we'd like to know about the text is once we've got words, they're parts of speech. And most importantly for spoken language, are they closed class words? Are they words from a fixed list that we can't invent new words in for any language? Like the determiners, the and a and so on, the articles? Or is it an open class word where we can invent new words, content words, names of objects and things in the world? And we can invent new ones of those and they are more likely to get prosodic emphasis, for example. It's not directly going to tell us how to say it, but it might tell us later on what to do with prosody. And we might go on and on. We might think that knowing something about the structure of the text might be useful. That might be helpful where to put phrasing. Um, we certainly want to know what the pronunciation of this thing is, the sequence of sounds. Um, in some languages, that might be a trivial mapping from the spelling, and in English, it's certainly not. And we might want to start with something sort of representation of prosody and, and so on, things like that. So that's uh, what we're trying to do. We're trying to enrich the text with lots of information, and we need to bring external knowledge sources to do that. And when we've got that, we can then generate our waveform. And we're going to look at this in the other, other parts of the summer school later on, but we better just check we know what we're going to do, so we know what the point of this front end is. Um, let's just say that there are kind of two choices. One is we're going to concatenate bits of waveform, and we'll find out this afternoon one way of doing that. That's called unit selection. Or we could build statistical models, and they won't directly generate waveforms. They'll drive a vocoder of the sort we saw yesterday. <laughs> and these look like discrete and very different ways of doing things, and it looks like there might be a very clear distinction between the stuff we do to text and the stuff we do here to generate the waveform. But hopefully, um, in an hour and a half from now, it'll be quite clear that that's not a clear distinction at all. And the responsibility of making some of the steps along this pipeline might rest with what we call the front end, or it might rest with what we call the regression model or the waveform generator. So this two-stage pipeline already is looking a bit dubious. This is how we might classically describe it. So uh, let's call it three-stage pipeline. Um, we're going to go to this linguistic specification, all the classical text processing stuff, pronunciations, things like that, where phrases fall. We're then going to optionally, or explicitly or implicitly, depending on the type of system, we're going to get from that sort of what might call a linguistic structure to something that's a specification of the acoustics. So not just how to say it, but what it's going to sound like. That might be the input to a vocoder. It might be spectral envelope and F0, some acoustic specification. And then from there, we'll actually generate the waveform. So what we found out yesterday was how to do this really, really well with very, very high quality. But what we didn't know yet was how to drive such a thing. And there's not a lot of point having a very high quality model of a speech signal, whether it's sinusoidal or AQHNM or however many letters it's got in its name, if we can't drive it, if we can't predict its inputs well. And choosing a vocoder might be constrained by how well we can drive it. In other words, how convenient its inputs are, how convenient its representations are. So then we've got this journey from text to speech. So our input text goes in here and our output speech comes out here, and we've got this rather long and complicated journey to get there, and we're going to do that with a sequence of techniques, and exactly how many there are in the pipeline and where their responsibilities fall actually varies a little bit with different systems. So let's just talk a little bit about different ways of getting through this journey so it'll become obvious what the front end's all about. I'm just going to introduce some terminology here. It might or might not be what we'll hear in the unit selection session, and I'll use it again later. In a classical unit selection system, we take the text and we predict a whole lot of symbolic things, the obvious one being the phonemes. We might predict symbolic representations of prosody, such as prominences and boundaries and so on. And then given only these symbolic things, we'll go and choose waveforms from a big inventory. And our choice will be based on matches or mismatches in these purely symbolic features. And in Paul Taylor's book, he introduced some terminology to talk about this. It's some acronyms. We don't need to worry too much about them. Um, but there's a way in which we only ever predict symbolic things in the front end, and everything else happens when we select the waveform. And Paul calls that the independent feature formulation, because these symbolic features are treated as independently, and we just have some weighted sum of them when we try and retrieve things from the acoustics. Some systems, in fact, kind of all systems actually, even festivals that would claim to only predict uh, symbolic things, 
go one step further and predict some acoustic properties as well before going to choose the waveforms. And Paul called that the acoustic space formulation. So you might imagine when we're going to do unit selection, we're going to retrieve bits of waveform from a database, we want them to be of the right sort, and that, that matching might be based on just their names, their symbols, or it might be based on their acoustic properties. Are they the sort of duration we would like? Are they, have they got the pitch that we would like? Or are we going to hope that the symbolic features will just get us that auto automatically? And then it's a very small step from there to go to what is now called a hybrid system. And in the hybrid system, we just go one step further and we just predict all the acoustic properties. And in the simplest case, we only use acoustic properties to retrieve waveforms from the database. So that's a f going even further down this pipeline. And going even further down the pipeline, we don't pre just predict all the acoustic properties and then retrieve a waveform. We use the acoustic properties to then actually generate a waveform with another regression model, so another continuous prediction. And that's statistical parametric speech synthesis using hidden Markov models or deep neural networks. And this is really, we could see this as something of a continuum. This is a slightly artificial categorization. And it's just a question of how we divide up this pipeline and how we assign the responsibility for getting us a little bit further down the journey to some module of the system. So in a classical unit selection system, which is the one you're going to hear next, we've got a front end, just like I'm about to describe it in the next hour or so. We have a very implicit regression model. We may or may not explicitly ever predict any acoustic properties. The regression might be implicit in retrieving units from the database. And by retrieving a unit, we get a continuous valued thing, a waveform, and that's a prediction. It's a very implicit, funny sort of regression model, but it is a regression model. And the waveform generator is almost trivial signal processing. It's concatenation of pre-recorded waveforms. Like all trivial signal processing, it's really hard to implement it well. Okay. The theory is very simple. The implementation is all about details. So that's what the picture you, you should have in mind as we're talking through the front end. And you're thinking, does this belong in the front end? Is this part of the regression model? Is this waveform generation? Don't worry too much what you call it. We're just steps along a journey. So we're just going to incrementally add information to the text. Some of the information might be symbolic. Eventually, some of the information might be continuous. So durations, we might predict durations of things. And then how we eventually generate the waveform might be to retrieve things, or it might be to get acoustic specification. So how we divide this journey into little steps is entirely up to us. It's a design choice. There's no right and wrong answers. Some just work better than others, and that's an empirical question, not a theoretical question. So let's see in pictures then the sort of things that sort of typically happen in the front end, and we'll just dive into detail in a few of them. I'm not necessarily going to use all the slides. If you've downloaded them, we'll, we'll pick and choose from those slides to see how the time goes. So inside the front end, it should be unsurprising then that the typical architecture of a front end is what we call a pipeline. It's a very naive architecture, and it's just a concatenation, a sequence of processes, many of which require the output of the previous process to do their job. So we need to predict part of speech before we can look up words in the lexicon, and we'll see why that is. And we need to predict certain things before other things in general. Now, that's kind of linguistically obvious that there's these hierarchies of, of linguistic information. Some things depend on others. From an engineering point of view, this is a terrible architecture because we get a cascade of errors. None of these things are perfect, and any error we make early on in the mod modules, so this tokenization, if we break the text into the wrong parts, if we cut something that should have been one word into two parts, it's very unlikely that further down the pipeline, anything will think to glue them back together and recover from that error. So we'll make lots of unrecoverable errors. Part of speech tag errors. If we tag something as a noun when it should have been a verb, and we go and look it up in the dictionary, and there happens to be a different in pronunciation, we're probably not going to recover from that. So we might, we're making hard decisions all the way down. So that's a weakness of this kind of architecture. So you can immediately start thinking, there might be better architectures than this. But this is the classical one. This is what Festival does. And I'm going to guess this is what a lot of commercial systems do as well. The other weakness of this architecture is that each of those steps is expensive to make. It's expensive in human effort, and it's expensive in knowledge required, and expensive in data required. We need to know a lot, and we need to be expert to build all of those modules. We might even need to be very expert, even to annotate the data to do the machine learning, if we're using machine learning. Sometimes we can get um, naive people to label things, but very often we need experts. Labeling prosody 
is something you need to kind of learn how to do. You need to be trained how to do. So that makes it expensive. And now you understand why even Nuance's language catalog is about 40 languages. And Google say they're so ambitious, we've got a huge target. We're going to do 200 languages. That's 200 out of 6,000. And those, the rest of those will be very, very expensive to do because we don't know much about the language. We don't have a lot of data. We might not be able to find someone who's linguistically expert. So to summarize, the architects is a chain of processes. Each one could be rather expensive to make in various ways, in time, in money, in data, in expertise. So let's look at a few of those to see why that is, to see what sort of data they need and what sort of knowledge you need before you can make any of these modules. Imagine you'd like to make a system for a new language. What would you have to go and do? So a typical process is a thing called a part of speech tagger. Who doesn't know what a part of speech is? Don't be afraid. We're all happy with this concept. So it's going to affect our lookup in the lexicon. So we get a matching part of speech for homographs, spelt the same, different part of speech, different pronunciation. And this is well-established technology. It's a pretty much a solved problem in NLP if you've got the data. And the data are simply large amounts of text that have been tagged. So that's boring. And you need a lot, millions of words to make a really good part of speech tagger. So we need to annotate actual text with part of speech. The good news is we don't need it read out loud. We just need text. The bad news is that when we do that, we tend to choose text that's completely inappropriate. We'll just pick newspaper text because it's convenient. We'll pick the Wall Street Journal or something really stupid. And that'll be nothing like the speech we're ever going to speak with our, say with our synthesizer. So we'll always all already have a mismatch. Nevertheless, these part of speech taggers are, are pretty accurate and are not, not really a limiting factor. Another process we might find further down the line is to go and find pronunciations of words. And an obvious way to do that is to look it up in a pronunciation dictionary. We'll always find that there are words not in the dictionary. We have to go and do letter to sound for those. So we'll see a bit later on that there are classical methods for converting letter to sound. We'll look at a really simple one, and I'll explain why we're doing the simple one later on. How would you write a dictionary? Well, get a lexicographer. Needs to be a native speaker needs to be linguistically sophisticated, needs to choose the set of symbols for pronunciation, needs to choose the phonemes, which might be non-obvious, and then just needs to sit down and write a dictionary. <coughs> That's kind of tedious. And we might write 20,000 entries, and then we go and synthesize and find that there's a word that we forgot. And there'll always be a word we forgot because it was a new word. So we need to extrapolate from that dictionary. We need to learn what's often called letter-to-sound rules. They're not really rules. Think of it as a statistical model. It's a classifier predicting symbols. Um, the training data for that classifier would just be the pronunciation dictionary. Now, in languages where we don't need a dictionary, we do have to literally sit down and write rules. And for languages like Spanish, we can probably do pretty well with rules, fairly comprehensive, until we get a loan word or an exception. And then we'll have to go and write a dictionary anyway. So how do we train letters to sound? Well, we take all the words in our dictionary. We make some correspondence between the letters and the sounds, some sort of alignment. Um, that might be sort of slightly expert driven, so a somewhat ad hoc alignment. Um, so reformat our data so it looks like nice, neat machine learning data. And then we'll learn a sequence to sequence model that learns to go from the sequence of letters. So it might learn to map from this letter to this sound. And in doing so, it'll look at the context in which this letter occurred. And so we'll build a classifier whose inputs are that and output is that. The nuances catalog and Google's um, aspirations for a catalog wouldn't include rules as such, just the annotations. For the letter to sound? Well, you, you mentioned that Nuance has this catalog of all <laughs> languages, but it doesn't include letter to sound rules. So the question is, do, do all the languages need letter to sound rules? Um, no, I'm just wondering what the catalogs have. So in, in a big catalog of many languages that, that, that some company has constructed or, or some researcher has constructed, each and every language would involve building all of these modules, which is why this catalog is rather limited in size. So we'd need to sit down and either write the rules by hand or create the dictionary and then use machine learning to extrapolate from but the dictionary. But really do have some procedure sussed out for letter to sound. I, w I would say that every commercial system does something for letter to sound. You may occasionally be able to be to treat the letters as if they were sounds and just do a one-to-one -one mapping, so a trivial letter-to-sound model. Oh, when I say catalog, I meant the list of languages they have available for sale. Yeah. So actual working systems. Let's move on in this pipeline. It gets worse. So, some of these modules in the pipeline, as we get further down, 
are not just doing these classifications where we can handcraft the data, they're doing some regression onto acoustic properties, and therefore we're going to need speech to learn them. And we're going to have to annotate that speech. If we're doing classical supervised machine learning, which is the thing that works best, we need some annotated speech to learn some steps. So an example of that might be to predict where to put phrase breaks, which are not just signaled by pauses, they're signaled by drops in F0 and resets and durational effects around the boundary. And so here's how it's done in festival. You take some speech, which fortunately you find someone else has annotated, but isn't very large, and that will be annotated with the thing we're trying to predict, prosodic phrase breaks. Um, I still don't have audio playback, so imagine someone saying this sentence. A 1918 state constitutional amendment made Annotator will annotate, there was prosodic phrase break there. And so the, the output of such a process will be a big data set, probably not that big, You'd be lucky if it's an hour or two of speech, and it's annotated with where the breaks were. And then we'll use another sequence-to-sequence -sequence model to predict breaks at runtime, at synthesis time. So this sequence, and typically we won't predict from the words, we'll predict from part of speech, because words are too sparse and there'll be unseen items. We'll collapse them to parts of speech, to categories, and learn a sequence model. And you can see that for every sentence, we might only have one positive example of a break. So we need even from a, an hour of speech, let's imagine 500 or 1,000 sentences, we're not going to have a whole lot of positive examples of phrase breaks to learn this model. So this is, this is tough for machine learning. This is uh, very sparse data. All right, that was a, a little whistle-stop tour of the sorts of things that happen. Let's go into a bit of detail in some of those, not all of them. So the question is, do we annotate more than phrase breaks? Um, yes, we'll see in a minute. Well, in a few, quite a few minutes, we'll see that we, we could choose to annotate um, Toby symbols, full, a full prosodic annotation, if we wish to do so. And then we would need to manually annotate the training data in order to train the classifier to do that. And indeed, that is what Festival does. Just one thing to say. Uh, since we make the recordings, and it's nice also for the others who are not here to hear also not the answer, but also the question. Yeah, I'll, so I'll, try, please... I'll try to repeat the question. I'll just no, 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 it's not necessary. You just you have to press the speak and okay. hear, and then... Okay. okay, let's try that. I might repeat the question anyway, it's uh, ingrained. Okay, so I'm going to take um, the festival speech synthesis system as a kind of canonical, um, boring, traditional, conventional example of a text-to-speech system. It's the one you're going to use in the lab. I couldn't possibly say it's state-of-the-art. I've already said that the front end hasn't been touched for a long time. But I think it's still pretty typical of what is done. And if you wanted a commercial system that was like this, you just add more rules, more exceptions, longer dictionaries, longer lists of acronyms, and clean up all of those, those edge cases. Maybe use smarter machine learning models, better fancier part of speech tagger, and so on. But the, the concept we're going to be, is going to be very similar. So that's the list of things that Festival does. Um, and let's uh, start going down the pipeline and see how far we get before the first break. So the first thing um, that Paul Taylor calls in his book text decoding is actually to find the words. Because text isn't made of words. Text is made of characters. And so we might have characters like this one. Here's a, a sentence. It's not made of words. It's made of some things that are very obviously words. That's a word. Um, I'm assuming this is a word, but it might not be in my dictionary, so I'd have to check that that's not something else. Um, that's not a word. Um, and that's not a word. What do I mean by a word? I mean something we might plausibly find in a pronunciation dictionary. Imagine a really big pronunciation dictionary, one of those 20-volume ones on the shelves that someone's listed every word that we can think of. If we think we might be able to just directly look it up in there, then we can say it's a word. Um, this is not going to be even in the Oxford English Dictionary. It would be ridiculous to start listing all possible numbers. So we're going to have to turn things into words. So we need to find the words. And before we can even do that, we need to break this thing into chunks that we can process further. And that's called tokenization. Tokenization is typically going to be done with some handcrafted things, something like a regular expression or some rules. It's going to depend a lot on the language. 
So in English, white space is a pretty good clue. It's not the only clue because we can see pronunciation next to a word without white space. So we need to know what counts as pronunciation and what's not pronunciation. That's language specific. So there are some pronunciation, punctuation symbols in Spanish that don't occur in English, this upside down question marks. Um, if that's not in our list of punctuation, it will get treated like a character and things will go wrong. And this is pretty straightforward. So we could do a decent job of that. Once we've chopped it into tokens, we're then going to go through each token one at a time and decide if it's a word or not. And if it's not a word, do something about it, turn it into words. So we need to detect whether things are words or not. The classical way of doing that would be to write long lists of all the things that we know about, all the acronyms, all the abbreviations and so on, and just have a big lookup table that helps us expand all the ones we've already seen before. For the ones we haven't seen before, we might do something like regular expressions. So to detect numbers, we can write, easily write a pattern that is a sequence of digits. The key problem, though, in doing that is that these things are ambiguous. So although you might have detected that this needs some further processing, you might also have detected that this needs some further processing. What you then do to it, what it expands to, depends on the context in which you find it. So it's not, we can't just do everything with a lookup table because we wouldn't know which, whether that's doctor or drive. And likewise, numbers, we could sit down and write by hand lots of expressions that match currency amounts or year amounts, dates, and so on. And this is kind of what festival does. So if something appears in a format that we didn't think of when we wrote those rules, it gets skipped by the rules and get handled by some default rule that will maybe just read the digits out as individual words as a fallback. So it's hard to say anything theoretical about all of that. It's a bit ad hoc. That's because language is messy. There's no reason to think there'd be some beautiful theory of text processing. Text is an evolved way of communicating. It doesn't necessarily obey rules. People are creative and productive. They invent new things. So there's no reason to think we should be able to write one elegant model that does all of text processing. It's perfectly reasonable that it would be a sequence of kind of messy things. We can say something about a general principle, though, of the sort of way that we might go around uh, processing the text, and that we might break it down into some stages. We might first detect that things are not standard words. Might look them up in the dictionary if we don't find them. We'll say it's not a standard word. That might be a very simple way of detecting it. Once we've done that, we might say, what sort of non-standard thing is it? And we might have a set of categories for that. Years, currency amounts, dates, times, and then some catch-all general rule that just says, read it out as a sequence of words the best you can. And then for each of those separate classes, some way of expanding that. So there's very specific ways of expanding. If this looks like it's going to be a year, there's a very specific rules about how to say that in each language. And we can just write rules. There's a case where rules will work fine. We don't need machine learning for that. So exactly how we detect, how we classify, how we expand is up to us. Um, there's lots of classical and simple methods for doing that. Detection might be some simple rules. Classification might be very simple machine learning classifiers, such as a decision tree. And expansion could be lookup tables or transducers or anything else you like. Typically, these will be very simple forms of machine learning because more sophisticated forms of machine learning, we might be tempted to throw a neural net at everything. We might find that we just don't have enough data to get good performance out of these kind of fancy machine learning methods. They're not as efficient with the data. We might find that a regular expression, a transducer, a handcrafted decision tree actually is more efficient with the data that we've got. It makes better use of the very small amount of data. So we spelled everything out as words. It's going to be somewhat language specific. It's going to be tedious to build. And you know we're not going to get many papers out of doing that. We've got to do it. And then we've got to start our journey getting towards how to say those words. So we've got things now that we could either look up in a dictionary. And if we don't find them, we can convert the spelling into a pronunciation some other way. And then we can start saying them, start adding more acoustical information. So let's talk about some of the things, some of the steps that might happen along that journey. And some of them are much more helpful in some languages than others. I'm not going to say anything about morphology. Morphology will be to break these words down into their smaller constituent parts in the hope that the pronunciation of a big complicated thing can be made by the pronunciations of its smaller things concatenated, possibly with some context-dependent rules. It doesn't help very much in English on the analysis side. So given an arbitrary word that's not in our dictionary, to automatically morphologically decompose it is error-prone and is not necessarily going to be super helpful. In some other language, like Finnish, where we've got some 
impossibly large possible number of word forms, it might be essential to try and break it down before we do anything else. Where morphology is useful in English is in actually creating the dictionary in the first place. So the lexicographer, when he or she wrote those 20,000 words, might not have wrote them all by hand, might have written a lot of base forms and some simple rules and said, let's just make lots of plurals by adding S wherever it's possible, or ES where necessary. So we could generate forms in the lexicon by rule. That's where it's going to work. Decomposing unseen words is going to be much harder. We have already talked a little bit about part of speech tagging. I'm not going to say so much more about that. Let's go straight on to looking things up in the dictionary and then worrying about what to do when we don't find them in the dictionary. So pronunciation of words. <clears throat> what to do about turning this string of letters into a string of pronunciation symbols, phonemes, typically. So a language like English, it's important to have a dictionary. Here's some annoying misuse of terminology. People say lexicon, they say dictionary. They use them interchangeably. I don't know what the difference is anymore. Dictionary will be more correct because it says how to say things. Lexicon's more just a list of words. Nevertheless, you'll find both used in the, li in the literature. A dictionary for text-to-speech needs to be a bit more sophisticated than the one for speech recognition. In speech recognition, all we would care about would be spellings, and pronunciations. And we just use this as part of the generative model of, of speech recognition as to generate from words to subword units. In synthesis, we need a little bit more than that because we're not going to use it in that way. We're going to have spellings and we're going to look up the phonemes and we, it's more important that we get the right phonemes here. So if we've got two identical spellings, we're going to have to make a hard choice between these two things. We can't make some probabilistic choice and say, let's try both, and let's try saying it as both and seeing what happens. Speech isn't like that. There are hard decisions. We need to pick one and stick to it. We can't say something halfway between these pronunciations, and we can't say some distribution over them. We're going to pick one. And so we need to make a choice between these two homographs, and in this case, it's easy because one's a noun form and one's a verb form. So we've got lives, the plural of life, and lives, the form of this verb, to live. So now we know why part of speech tagging is important, to go and look up the right thing in the dictionary. There'll be cases that this doesn't work for. There'll be words that have the same spelling and the same part of speech and still have different pronunciations. Um, there's examples of this in the textbooks, lots and lots of examples of words like that. The favorite one in all the textbooks, so we have to use it, is this word here. It's a kind of silly one, because it's quite a low frequency words. It's either bass, which is a musical term, or bass, which is a fish. I've never had to synthesize bass, the word fish, <laughs> except when testing festival. But nevertheless, they both, they're both nouns, and we couldn't discriminate between them with a the part of speech tagger. So we need to do something called word sense disambiguation. And we're essentially just going to look at the words in the context, and if in the rest of this sentence there were some music sort of words, that were co-located, we'll pick the musical sense. If there were some fishing sort of words, then we'd pick the fishy sense. And this is a standard natural language processing problem, word sense disambiguation, and we can do it very straightforwardly and fairly accurately. So looking things up in the dictionary is fine if we get the part of speech tag right. We might need to do this clever word sense disambiguation first. And the lexicon would have to have both senses and have some extra annotation saying, this is the fishy sort of B-A-S-S, -S, and this is the musical sort, an extra tag, so we, when we look it up from our words as disambiguator. Nevertheless, that's a completely solvable, straightforward natural language processing problem. It's going to be hard for unseen words. Someone invents a new word and then uses it, the same spelling for two in new invented words. We'll have a very hard time discriminating between those two. But we need more than this string of pronunciation symbols. We need also some structure within the word. Structure of the sounds, not structure of the spelling, not the morphology, but the syllable structure of the sound. And so this is going to be absolutely essential when we come to start deciding how to pronounce this. And that's going to be true whether we're doing unit selection, waveform concatenation, or a statistical model. In all of those cases, 
the structure of the syllables will be very useful in either choosing appropriate units and where to make joins, or is predictive features for our regression onto the acoustic premise of a vocoder. There are various reasons for that. <clears throat> the most obvious one is that syllable structure helps us decide where to put prominences, where to put prosodic events. So in the, in the dictionary itself, we might already start assigning some prosodic features. So there's some prosodic features that belong to words themselves, and they tell the difference between two words. In tone languages, there might be other pitch features called tones. We could also mark up in the dictionary. We'll discriminate between words. So we've got two words here, and they've got the same spelling and a different part of speech. But not only is the phoneme sequence different, the pattern of emphasis is different. So we'll call this lexical stress. Lexical because we can mark it in the lexicon, and it's specific to the particular word. And in festival, everything's marked up in this horrible bracketed notation. That's just the language it uses. And we mark stress with ones and lack of stress with zeros. So we might have present and present as these different word forms. And getting that wrong is going to be a very salient error to the listener. It's a different word. So it's got a different meaning. I'm a little confused. So the one and zero is syllable stress. So the, que the question is whether this one and zero are Syllable stress, I'm going to call this lexical stress, and it's a feature that attaches to the syllables of a word. <clears throat> and in every word, there's going to be one syllable that's got the primary lexical stress, and there might be another syllable that's got some secondary stress in a long polysyllabic word. You might even imagine some sort of tertiary stress in a sufficiently long word. There might be a third place that gets a little bit more prominent as well. But the key is to get this primary lexical stress, and we can mark it in the lexicon. Now, this doesn't mean it will get some enormous pitch movement at synthesis time, but it means it's the, it's the sort of place we might do something with prosody. So what does lexical stress do for us? It says, when we're coming later to predict prosody, this syllable is a very likely candidate to do something interesting with, to make it longer, louder, to move the pitch around. And this syllable is a very unlikely place to do something. You probably don't want to go on making this syllable sound longer and louder and have some pitch movement. You might want to do exactly the opposite. You might want to make it shorter, quieter, have boring pitch, and even make the acoustics somewhat reduced. Already this has got a reduced vowel in it. So how does this work with the phrasal stress? Because how does this work with the phrasal stress? Uh, so the, the syllabic stress is, or the lexical stress is different from the phrasal stress. Yeah. And so let's so think of lexical stress as possible locations where something prosodically interesting might happen, but it's not guaranteed to happen. We don't know yet because we're only talking about words in the dictionary in isolation, in their canonical form. Things are going to happen to them when we start putting them in context. For example, if this is the focus of the sentence or not. And what other words around it are going to have prominences or saliences. So think of those candidate sites ready to receive some prosodic event. They may or may not get one. We're going to have to compete with the other words to see who gets them. Because in any one phrase or any one sentence, we can only have so many prominent or salient syllables. If we put pitch accents on all possible lexical stress syllables, the speech will sound hyper-articulated and a bit overexcited and unnatural. So we need to, some of them won't get these events or we'll get smaller events. We'll come to that. So how do you actually like uh, split a word into a bunch of syllables? And does there actually like exist multiple ways of splitting? Like in the case of the first pre present, it's like you can do it like P, R, E, H, and Z, E, X, and T. Yeah, excellent question. So question is, how do we syllabify the words, first question? Um, in the lexicon, we do it by hand, because we have knowledge. We, have, we are an expert. Uh, we have linguistic knowledge of the language, so we, we write down the correct syllabification. For unknown words, words that we're predicting with letter to sound that we'll see shortly, we also have to predict the syllabification. So we'll need some, some statistical predictive model of syllabification. Can we use rules also? Like this model of syllabification could be a fancy statistical model. It could be just some rules. And indeed, um, the words in the dictionary, we also have, might have made some explicit or implicit choices when we manually syllabify those as to, as, as the question implied, there might be some consonants here 
well, it's not entirely obvious which syllable they might belong to. Is this present or present? Both of those seem plausible and reasonable to me as a native speaker. So there are various uh, principles and rule-based systems on which you might do that, one of which is called maximal onset, which says put as much on the beginning of syllables as possible. But there are other, other schemes as well. So <clears throat> this is for English, and uh, I guess it's you know, maybe in part following linguistic tradition to think about stress accent as either being primary, primary secondary, or off. Uh, when you have a Chinese lexicon, I'm assuming that you need lexical tone in here as well, and then you probably, again, follow the traditional grammarians by putting one of four possible tones. And I'm, I'm wondering whether there are any kind of um, anecdotes of experiences in TTS where the where the linguistic background story about stress or tone or you know whatever it is that goes in this lex lexicon has proven to be simply in a, uh, insufficient and and you need something else to support inference of the kind that all of these people are talking about in order to actually find the trajectory and know the duration and all of that or do people just generally follow the linguists um so in terms of what you manually mark up in the lexicon when you construct it, I suspect people stick to um, well-established knowledge and conventions. And you're, you're, I think you're implying that the, the, the knowledge that's present here in the dictionary may or may not be acoustically accurate. Um, and so that's a, that's a fair question. And I think in um, statistical parametric systems, we do have some chance of recovering from that if we systematically see disagreements between these annotations and the way our speaker spoke, and there's enough data, and we can somehow predict from context what the difference between those two is, then we can still get the correct pattern of stress. The same probably applies to tone. Um, that's problematic because there's simply probably not enough data in our speech database to find those sort of systematic discrepancies between what we marked up in the dictionary, um, what we get in, in the speaker's uh, rendition of the text. Um, I don't have a lot more to say about that, um, other than it's one of these things people haven't looked at a lot recently. And don't tend to evaluate in these terms to detect if this is a particular problem. I'm going to hypothesize this is not a particular problem because the intelligibility of current systems is extremely good and errors here would affect intelligibility to some extent. Right, as we get towards the first break, let's just start talking about going from letter to sound. Now for some languages, we'll always use Spanish as the canonical example of this, phonetically beautiful, Five vowels, very neat and tidy, you think. It's not quite so neat and tidy. The relationship between spelling and sound is very regular. As, as my wife, who actually teaches Spanish, says, you say every letter. Except you don't say H. <laughs> except in some cases. Except in some parts of Spain. <laughs> you go to Seville, they just chop the ends of things off and so on. So it looks neat and tidy in its canonical perfect form, but it's not so with every speaker. And in, the, in that relatively simple case, we could actually sit and write rules by hand of, of this sort of form. Let's, let's do it for English, because that's the language we have in common. We start, sit down, and we'd like to write some rules for um, the letter C. C appears in, in lots of different contexts and has lots of different pronunciations. It can be k, ch, s, sh, this ch, or it can just be silent. It just depends, okay? And we could start thinking, right, if it's at the beginning of a word, there's nothing before it, and it has an I after it, it doesn't matter what happens next, this will be S. Words like system or so on. So we can start writing these rules down, and this, this works very well if things are regular. And it looks like it's going to start working well for English, but it won't. Because we'll need a very large set of rules, and as soon as we have a large set of rules, we'll get inconsistencies between the rules. We get conflicts between rules. So rule-based approaches are great if the set of rules is small and the order in which you apply the rules is obvious. If the order in which you apply them is non-obvious, if changing the order changes the outcome, and there are nasty interactions, some rules need to know the decision of a previous rule, then we, before we know it, we've got some horrifically 
big bowl of spaghetti. And these rules become impossible to maintain, and fixing of an error in one place creates two errors in another place. And so for that reason, we'll tend not to sit down and write these rules for English, and there are probably some other languages where that applies to. I was going to finish off saying one little thing about letter to sound, what we do after we've looked things up, and then we're going to just rewind and go and look at one very simple form of machine learning, which you might be a little bit familiar with, but it's so important that we're going to just go over it in a bit more detail, and that's classification and regression trees. Festival uses classification and regression trees for everything. It's the neural net of the early 1990s. Okay? If we don't know what to do, we throw a classification or regression tree at it. And it works great, up to a point, if there's data. Let's just say what happens after we've done that, just to wrap up that part. Pronunciation can't be entirely determined on a word-by-word -word basis. There are things that happen when we put words in sequence. So we can only do certain things after we've looked up in the lexicon or the dictionary. And so they're called post-lexical effects. In the vast majority of systems, all systems I'm, I'm familiar with, the number of post-lexical effects that we attempt to deal with is very, very small. And we just pick the most important ones. So in French, it might be liaison. In English, some accents of English, it might be this linking R. If we need to make an R sound to link two words together. Um, it might be devoicing things at the ends of words in certain contexts and so on. So a very, very small number of rules. And in festival, this set is small and it's, it's, some of it's just hardwired into the code because they're so important and so predictive, so useful that we just, they're just always there and they're always on. Some might be specific to the speaker in which we, we might need to turn them on or off depending on the accent of the language that we're dealing with. This will be completely language specific. All languages do things to words as we string them together. No language sounds like isolated words concatenated. Otherwise, synthesis will be really easy, right? We just can concatenate whole words. Right. We're going to watch a five-minute video and then take a, a break. And then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the video. So you give some time to think about it. There, I guess. So we do need audio. We do. We do. Yes, we do. I know, so can you try? I'm not getting it, sir. What we'll do, we'll take a break, and then after the break, we'll watch a video with sound. Yes. yes. Okay? That's a good idea. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh,